Welcome to the JBP Podcast, Season 4, Episode 25 with Richard Tremblay. I'm Michaela Peterson. Richard Tremblay and Jordan Peterson spoke on April 7th, 2021, and discussed Richard's research with physical aggression and juvenile delinquency, what surprised him of his findings, risk factors that lead to aggressive behavior in adults, experimental interventions with mothers to decrease aggression in children, the biology of aggression, what compelled him to do the research, and more. Dr. Richard Tremblay is a Canadian child psychologist and professor of pediatrics, psychiatry, and psychology at the University of Montreal, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Child Development. His research is focused on the development of aggressive behavior in children and the potential for early intervention programs to reduce the chances of children turning to crime in adulthood. In 2017, he received the Stockholm Prize in Criminology for his work studying delinquency in children, making him the first Canadian to receive this prize. I hope you enjoy this episode. I'd like to tell you guys about Headspace. Maybe you've tried meditation before and it didn't work, or maybe you haven't tried it. If mental health is part of your self-care plan this year, which it should be, there's nothing more important, you should check out and try Headspace. I used to think that meditation was a waste of time when I was young and less into crystals. Just kidding, I'm not into crystals, yet. Anyway, Headspace helps put me in the right frame of mind as I start my day. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. Headspace really can help you feel better and less stressed. Overwhelmed? Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation for you. Need help falling asleep? Headspace has wind-down sessions their members swear by. And for parents, Headspace even has morning meditations you can do with your kids. I've tried one of them with Scarlett, and they're great. Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in an easy-to-use app. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits, 600,000 five-star reviews, and over 60 million downloads. Headspace makes it easy for you to build a life-changing meditation practice with mindfulness that works for you on your schedule anytime. Just 30 days of Headspace lowers stress by 32%, and just four sessions can reduce burnout by 14%. You deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash jbp. That's headspace.com slash jbp for a free one-month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. This is the best deal offered right now. Headspace.com slash JBP. I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to talk today with Dr. Richard Tremblay, Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics and Psychology at the University of Montreal and Emeritus Professor of Public Health at University College Dublin in Ireland. I've known Richard for a long time, since the mid-80s. I worked with him in Montreal uh, for a number of years, along with my supervisor, Robert Peel. I, I, I worked on alcoholism and aggression at that time mostly and I I did get to know Richard quite well he was a pronounced influence on my on my scientific thinking especially in relationship to subjects like childhood aggression um, adult antisocial behavior and criminality and alcohol and drug abuse and Richard dominated I would say the the, the social science research world in Quebec for 30 years uh, attracting a massively disproportionate share of research funding because of the quality of his longitudinal studies. Those are long-term studies following people over decades, very, very clinical studies, very, very, very difficult to administer and to design and to implement and to fund and to write up and to analyze. Uh, Extremely complex work. And I think you can make a reasonable case that while his work on aggression is certainly among the most profound and and unexpected of the last 50 years. Um, In Montreal, he conducted, and elsewhere, he conducted a program of 
both longitudinal and experimental studies on physical, cognitive, emotional, and social development from conception to adulthood, although his main focus is on the development and the prevention of chronic physical aggression. So that goes, in some sense, to the heart of criminology. He's an officer of the Order of Canada, which is roughly equivalent to a Canadian knighthood, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and of the Academy of Experimental Criminology. In 2017, he won the Stockholm Prize in Criminology for his research on the developmental origins of violent behavior. And I was hoping to talk to Richard today particularly because the issue of aggression, and more specifically male aggression, is uh, extraordinarily popular, let's say, a popular media topic. But the level of general uh, knowledge about the scientific about scientific research into aggression and the conclusions of that research, it's not disseminated well at all. And people are un unreasonably misinformed about what aggression is and how it emerges and how it might be controlled and, and how it manifests itself in families and what the implications of that are for social policy and all of those things. And so I'm hoping today with Richard that we can shed some light on all of this. And that's the purpose of the discussion. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the topics addressed in a 1999 scientific paper that Richard authored along with a sequence of co-authors called The Search for the Age of Onset of Physical Aggression. Rousseau, a philosopher who assumed that people were naturally good but corrupted by the social order, and Bandura, who championed the idea of social learning, a psychologist, Revisited. Rousseau and Bandura revisited. Richard starts by pointing out that studies of aggression often fail to separate physical aggression from verbal aggression, indirect aggression, microaggressions, let's say, relational aggression, opposition, competition, and other so called externalizing behaviors. So Maybe you could start by commenting up about on that, Richard, because one of the th key features of your work is the specificity of your definitions, and we need to know about the reason for that. Yes, well, <clears throat> when I started uh, doing research, I, I was doing research on, on um, juvenile delinquency, essentially. Uh, the, the general problem of juvenile delinquency. I did my uh, PhD thesis on, on this. And um, I, I was brought on to uh, study physical aggression because it, it appeared to be a narrower uh, type of problem, um, easier to study than uh, simply uh, juvenile delinquency. And as I worked on that problem of, of aggression, I realized that people were using the word aggression to mean all sorts of, of things. Um, and I sort of slowly zoomed in on the physical aggression research, thinking that it would be much simpler to study. Um, and I did that in part because I was interested in looking at the early signs of uh, problems with physical aggression. And when you start looking at young children, very young children, um, you become amazed to see how frequently they physically aggress each other. Um, and they are much less sophisticated than elementary school children or, or adolescents or adults. Uh, so the action is really on into physical aggression. And as we measured the physical aggression uh, in early childhood and developmentally over time, um, it became very obvious that what we were all thinking that aggression increased with age and sort of peaked in 
adolescence, late adolescence, we showed that physical regression was at its peak in terms of frequency um, around age, between age two and age three. Um, we uh, were looking at um, <clears throat> in daycare centers and I, I finally discovered that the, the place in the world where you're most at risk of being physically aggressed is in a daycare center uh, when you're between age two and age three. The amount of physical aggressions is incredible. <clears throat> of course, they are not well coordinated and they are not very strong. So the damage is not the same damage as a physical fight when uh, you look at adolescence, but the frequency of physical aggression uh, <clears throat> is clearly there. And to a certain extent, it changed my uh, way of looking at this problem of aggression uh, through, throughout development from very early childhood um, until, uh, until adulthood. Okay, so you, you adopted a narrow focus to begin with, and you concentrated on physical aggression. And if I remember correctly, and please do correct me, the markers were, so the even more basic markers and measurable markers were kicks, hits, bites, and steals. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Okay, okay so now one of the problems that scientific researchers in the field of psychology have is that they try to investigate... Uh, terms that people often use descriptively, like anxiety. But a scientific category needs to be only what it is and nothing else. And so it, it has to be, it's a particular kind of category. If you say anxiety to someone, you usually surround that with an explanatory framework so that the person can understand what you're talking about. So you don't have to be that precise in your use of the word anxiety. But if you're trying to measure it in a repeatable way, then you have to zero in on something that is essentially as close to one thing as you can manage, and that's narrow. And you picked kicks, hits, fights, and steals. And I, I would say that is observable, but it, it also, I think, and probably not by accident, gets to the heart of what people are really concerned about when they talk about male criminality and aggression. Because the, the biggest sociocultural and personal impact of criminal behavior, or maybe the most emotionally valent part of it, is the, the physical violence aspect. And, and that seems central. Is that fair? Yes, yes, it is. It's uh, uh, whether it's war or uh, being uh, physically aggressed by a, a neighbor, uh, it's. Uh, it creates more damage and, and it's a threat to your life. Yeah, so, okay, so it's, you, so it's useful to simplify, it was useful to simplify it so that it could be measured and observed, but it was also a move that allowed you to get right to the heart of what was important about antisocial behavior and criminal yeah. behavior and so forth. Exactly. And, 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 okay, okay, so, and then you, it's so easy to jump over these things, and even in your papers, because these ideas are revolutionary in a sense that isn't immediate, immediately obvious in the cautious manner in which they're couched. Because people do assume, for example, that children learn aggression. And, that, and as you pointed out, that aggression is much more common, say, among adolescent males or young adult males. But even much to your surprise, that isn't what you found. So I would like to ask you two questions about that. Like, why do you think you were surprised what had you gone in there expecting? And how does this violate the assumptions that people, including scientists, generally make about aggression? Yeah. Well, it, it, um, you, you cited uh, Rousseau and Bandura. Um, the research on aggression uh, made me realize that uh, their perspective on we are born good and it's your environment that makes you <laughs> bad, um, didn't work uh, when you were looking at one of the worst things you call bad is 
physical aggression. Uh, because we were following children uh, from essentially birth and the children that we, we, we were following then, they're now in their 40s and we are still following them. We, we showed that between birth and adulthood, the time at which you use physical aggression against others most often is uh, between two and three. And the reason it's not uh, at one or, or uh, at six months, it's because by the time you're two and three, you're much more able to aggress others in terms of you, you can run, you can hit, you can kick. Well, as you don't see that at six months, uh, but these behaviors are, are clearly there at the start. And as we follow the children over time up to adulthood, we saw very clearly that the frequency of physical aggression was going on, was dropping, there was less and less phys frequency of physical aggressions up uh, to uh, adulthood. Um, so the idea that we learn from an en our environment to aggress um, doesn't fit the data at all. Uh, it's rather with time, we learn not to physically aggress because everybody, even those who were physically aggressing very often, with time, the frequency decreases. There is, there is more damage if you get hit by an adolescent than by a two-year-old. But in terms of frequency, we learn not to use physical aggression as we get older. Okay, so what we might say that this constitutes a delayed victory for the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who had exactly, a or and from um, the uh, the inventor of uh, the uh, original sin, um, the idea of the original sin. Uh, comes from uh, the uh, <clears throat> the Saint um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> I, I'm, he he lived he lived in um, uh, um, in Rome. Um, Saint uh, not Saint Thomas Aquinas. I, it's okay. We'll uh, we'll find. Well, it. anyway, uh, th this this saint. Um, describes, he says, I want to find when I started to commit uh, sins. And he says, I went to see the children, very young children, and I can see that I started to sin very early in life. Um, I beat my parents, I hit everybody. And so this idea has been there for a long time, but there has been this big resistance to believe um, that we are born to live like animals and that with time uh, we learn to live in a civil society. Okay, so do you have any sense, Richard, of why that resistance manifested itself? And and, but, and I would also say continues to, because it seems to me that the default view that people are good, especially children, innately, and that they're corrupted by exposure to bad models and by society, I would say that's, that's the default view. And it's certainly the default view on the left end of the political spectrum. So why do you think that that became so dominant if the data even the observational data was there thousands of years ago, let's say, and, and, and certainly is there in the scientific literature now. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a normal reaction of humans to uh, 
uh, not to accept the the from an evolutionary perspective we are uh, animals that have sort of learned to live together in a, a more sophisticated way than 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 the monkeys uh, uh, and the chimpanzees but it's very clear that if if we take a darwinian uh, perspective to evolution um, it makes a lot of sense and Uh, Darwin was also one of those who uh, who started who said at one point I am looking at the way my children behave and it's clear that my children are using physical aggression uh, within the first year of life um, and he was a very careful observer he was uh, and it, it, it he wrote uh, Uh, quite a lot about uh, the behavior of his children, and it inspired him in terms of understanding uh, human uh, human development. Okay, so back to back to Hobbes. He's sort of the antithesis of Rousseau, and Hobbes believed that in the state of nature, life would be nasty, brutish, and short, and that it was exactly. only socialization that made us civilized. And your data essentially support that viewpoint, except it's it's more complex because Rousseau wins to some degree because you've tracked out three developmental pathways. So although on average, young children are more aggressive than older children and adolescents, if you look, your, your research and others indicates that if you look at the population of young children, all children are not equally violent. And so maybe you could walk us through that. Yes. Um, yes, the, there are uh, important differences between children. Those who are most uh, aggressive uh, use physical aggression most often early in life. Um, are uh, I don't have the data in front of me, but it, it it's much, not much more than 20, 25 percent. And a lot of children are not using physical aggression. And there is the uh, difference between males and, and females. We get uh, similar developmental trajectories, uh, but essentially most girls do not use uh, physical aggression. Um, okay, so your data, the data I reviewed this morning sh suggested that about 30% of children use very little aggression to begin with. Yes. 50% use some, and s about 17% are quite aggressive, and they stay that way. They tend to stay that way. They, they, they remain relatively high to the others, but they, they decrease with time. R right. The frequency so, sorry, decreases an, with time. So, right. So, so, those who are likely to be aggressive in adolescence were also likely to be aggressive as children, but all children, including the aggressive children, tend towards less aggression as they mature. Yes, yes. But also, again, we sh it's, it's useful to repeat this. So 30% are, show very little aggression across the board, right from childhood onward. 50% are in the mixed group using aggression sometimes when they're children, but that declines precipitously as they age. And then there's 17%, They decline as well, but the population of aggressive adolescents is disproportionately drawn from those children who were e exceptionally aggressive in their earliest infancy. Yes. Okay, and there, okay, so then let's focus on the ones that were particularly aggressive. So Rousseau wins a bit because there's a substantial proportion of children who just don't use aggression at all as a, as a strategy. So it's a mixed, it's a mixed model. And, and so, um, The, the, peop, the, 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 the aggressive individuals, the biggest risk factor I think you identified for being in the more aggressive category, the most aggressive category, was gender, sex. So if you're a boy, it's much more probable. And I think the odds were two to one. Is, is that correct? Approximately that? Uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but if, you, if you've looked at it this morning, you must be closer, <laughs> close to... Uh... That's yeah, and then you showed okay. So, so it was it was 
um, they were they were more likely to be male. And then there were other important contributors as well. They were more likely, for example, to have mothers who did not complete their high school education. That was the next uh, the, the next most important risk factor. Um, what what other risk factors for that early aggression did you identify? Well, um, in most of the studies, we, we are showing that uh, a lot of the characteristics of the of the boys who, who have problems are characteristics related to their mothers having uh, problems, um, both psychological uh, and um, <clears throat> social so, social problems. Um, and I've, I've called that the Hydra problem in the sense that um, girls who have adjustment problems are likely to have children and especially boys who will have important problems. And what do you mean by adjustment problems? If, if you're going to characterize what you've observed about the mothers who are more likely to have aggressive boys in particular, and also to not c control it as well as they develop. Yeah. How would you describe well, the typical mother? Girls, or this girls who, who fail in school, um, uh, girls who um, have uh, emotional problems, um, <clears throat> Girls, um, in the, the all everything that, that we've measured, uh, for, for example, in terms of problems with smoking, with drugs, um, almost every problem that you can mention, there is a tendency uh, for girls who have these problems uh, to have children uh, and especially boys who will have difficult it's not only difficulties with uh, physical aggression uh, but their children will have more problems in social adjustment in in um, succeeding in school um, and so over time it's been it's become quite clear to me that if we want to help children in terms of their development and high-risk children, the best strategy is to support, to give support to girls um, early on uh, who have adjustment problems um, in, uh, in the school system because they are the best predictors of boys who will have the problems that we are talking about. So there is this intergenerational um, problem. Uh, girls are more involved in helping their children uh, grow up than males, uh, but also it's related to um, what's happening during pregnancy. So if you have a girl who during pregnancy is smoking, taking drugs, uh, using alcohol, um, it's quite clear from simply a medical, uh, biological perspective uh, that this child's brain will be affected in a negative way. And that child will have much more difficulty controlling himself. And that's quite clear. It's relatively clear that the boys will suffer uh, from that perspective more than, uh, than the baby girls. But the baby girls will reproduce um, the same type of problems that their mother had. So then, so that hypothetically, then the aggression problem among, among the boys will occur 
among the daughters of the girls you're talking about a, a generation later. Um, so you, you said it's it's transmitted intergenerationally. So yes. the girls that you're talking about have girls and they don't do well either, even though it's not so they, manifest in aggression, but maybe their right. children are also at risk. That's right. That's and that's the multi-generational aspect. Yeah. Okay, so pregnancy is a cru is crucial. And, and you talked about some of the behaviors that can compromise fetal development. And of those behaviors, is there a rank order of catastrophe? So, for example, I, fetal alcohol, alcohol is extremely toxic during pregnancy, as particularly at certain key moments. There's a period when the hippocampus develops, if I remember correctly. And if you drink on that day or that week, then that's likely to produce longstanding cognitive problems. So there are critical periods. Alcohol use during pregnancy, smoking, are those the major risk factors for, for, for pregnancy trouble or or? What else? What other factors? Well, there, are there's there's also s some mental health problems mm -hmm. in, in terms of, for example, depression. Um, we haven't measured everything, uh, but most of the uh, emotional behavioral problems that individuals have are likely to affect the next generation um, and because mothers are the ones who are um, getting pregnant, what they do during pregnancy is going to affect uh, the development of their child's brain and that will affect how well uh, they uh, adjust to their environment uh, after, after birth. So so you, do you think that whatever neurological impairment emerges as a consequence of uh, less than optimal pregnancy increases the proclivity for aggression per se or decreases the probability that the child will be able to learn to control it? Well, any, any, do you, is, is there any data on that? <laughs> no, it's a hard distinction yeah, to make. No, it's, it's a very hard distinction. Um, no, there, there's not clear data on that. I, I think the, the approach to, to getting um, closer to understanding exactly what's happening is when we are using a, um, a prevention approach an experiment in terms of prevention and it's maybe it's it's time to introduce this approach a part of the long the studies that i've been doing are longitudinal studies where we simply follow uh, thousands of families from pregnancy until the the children's adult life uh, but a, a a more uh interesting approach is, but more difficult, is experimental interventions. So in those experimental interventions, researchers um, think up of a, a way of treating the problem, of preventing the problem. And so we do an experiment and there have been very nice experiments that have been done. Um, on helping uh, young women who have behavior problems, emotional problems, and become pregnant in helping them, supporting them during pregnancy and after birth um, so that we can see to what extent we can help their children adjust better to uh, their environment. And um, David Olds in, in the United States has been doing what I think are the best studies on uh, the experimental studies on helping high-risk uh, girls. And the results, he's been doing this for uh, at least um, 25 quarter of a century. And so we have data on the outcome, the long-term outcome for the children. Um, 
And it's very clear that giving support to young pregnant women who have uh, behavior, mental health problems, um, is helping their children in the long run to adjust much better to their environment. Um, and interestingly, the, the latest data that I've seen is showing that it's helping the baby girls more than helping uh, the baby boys. So it, it may take uh, at least two, two, two generations to be able to help the boys um, that would have major problems if their mothers were not being helped. So what is it that, what does the support that's offered to these mothers that works consist of? What needs, what needs to be done? And you also mentioned young women. So is one of the risk factors as well, age of mother at birth? Yes. Well, yes. Uh, age of mother at, at birth it has traditionally been um, an indicator that there is a problem uh, Girls and what about what about marital status? I mean, there's a huge body of literature, and again, correct me if if I'm not up to date on this, indicating that on average, children without fathers, stable fathers, do much worse across a whole variety of indices than children with stable fathers. And now you could make a couple of cases for that. You could say that in maybe the women that you're talking about are less likely to attract a stable partner. And so it isn't actually the presence of the man that's the determining factor. It's the fact that instability is more likely in a relationship if the young mother is unstable herself. Um, what do you think about, and, and you're not seeing a role for fathers precisely in, in the developmental trajectory of aggression. So what do you, what do you how do you, comprehend the fatherlessness literature and the literature you're discussing? How do they fit together or not? Um, well, uh, part of the problem is assortative mating. Um, and there's very interesting uh, data coming out from, uh, I think it's in Sweden, uh, at least one of the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries where it, it's very clear um, because they have access to the data from the whole population, um, the data is pretty good. And, and there's clearly um, assortative mating among people who have psychological problems. Who okay, have so you have to define problems. that. You have to define yeah, that for okay. everyone. So what's, what's the phenomenon? Assortative mating means that uh, you are mating with a mate that has some of the same characteristics as you have. So if, if we, we are talking, say, for mental illness, if girls who, who have mental illness problems uh, are more likely to have children with men who have mental illness, illness problems. Um, so, Do you suppose that's a consequence of access across hierarchies? So if you're, if you're put into a socioeconomic rung in part because of your um, impaired mental ability, let's say, um, either cognitively or with regards to mental disorder, that the people that you're exposed to and likely to initiate a relationship are much more likely to be drawn from that strata Yes, well, the, the, yeah, the, there is, uh, there's a sort of mating related to um, the, the social class that you are in. So you, people tend to mate with people from the same social class. But within a social class, uh, there appears to be uh, also a sort of mating for having problems. And, and to a certain extent, it, it makes sense that that if if you're not if you're mentally you have mental health problems, you are not attractive to someone who doesn't have problems. Um, so people who don't have mental health problems tend to mate with people who don't have mental 
problems. Uh, and those who have mental health problems tend to mate with, I mean, th this is not, uh, we're talking about probabilities here. Right, right, right. Well, um, so, so, so it becomes very difficult to parse apart the biological influences and the influences of impaired physical health and the soci sociological and family environment influences. Yes. What do you see as a what do you see as the role of, of of as the beneficial or harmful role of fathers in a in a in in the upbringing of children in relationship to violence? Well, um, there there is uh, certainly um, the the model in the sense that if uh, if the parents uh, the the father or, or the mother are um, using physical aggression with the children and are using physical aggression among themselves. It's very hard for a child to learn not to use physical aggression. So that there is uh, a modeling. Right, it's, uh, well, it's, so is it, is it modeling of the aggression or is it failure to model the inhibition of aggression? Well, which seems, <laughs> well, it yeah. seems in some sense more likely it's because the thing about aggression, especially at the level that you study, is it's not that sophisticated in some sense. It's not that hard to learn to hit. It's sort of there. What's hard to learn is to implement, a, like if, if you want someone's toy, you want to play with their toy and you're little, you can hit them and take it, or you can figure out a more sophisticated strategy so that you can both play together. But that's actually hard. And that, in principle, would take modeling and proper reinforcement and all of that. And, and so part of this, I think, is a model of simplicity versus sophistication. Yes. And, and then we talked about this years ago, too, and I'd, I'd like to know how your thoughts have stayed the same or changed over time. Do you think that the children who are becoming, that, that children, as they become less aggressive, are inhibiting their aggression? Or do you think they're integrating it into more sophisticated behaviors? So, well, and, uh, yeah. I think it's it's both um, it's both in in the sense that from a, a an cognitive perspective, um, as we uh, develop, uh, we are we become cognitively more sophisticated, and, and we understand the co consequences of these. Uh, behaviors. If uh, if you hit and you get hit, and with time you learn that you it's, you won't get hit as often if you if you're not hitting. Um, <clears throat> so um, and there is that control over yourself, um, and there are the models. So. so I, I don't think it's one or the other. It's a number of factors that bring you uh, to uh, understand uh, and to be able to control your behavior and, and not use aggression um, and use more, more sophisticated ways. When you see um, parents who have been successful in bringing their more aggressive child's aggression under control developmentally. Hmm. Have you developed any insight into the nature of the disciplinary strategies they're using? Because I was looking at, at the outcome studies, the intervention outcome studies today before we talked, and I thought, um, what happens in families that are functioning well when a child manifests an aggressive behavior? What sort of disciplinary strategies are implemented to encourage that child, let's say, to use his words uh, instead of hitting or something like that. And in my observations of parents who don't know what they're doing with their children, they're often left completely adrift when their child manifests an aggressive behavior. They seem to have absolutely no idea about how to respond to that in a way that makes it less likely in the future. Or sometimes they even covertly reinforce it. So have you, are the microanalysis of, of disciplinary strategies there yet, or, or is it still vague and, and unknown? Well, the, uh, there, are, there are efforts at, uh, at looking at that, but from, from my perspective, 
this area, this is so complex. There are so many factors that are involved that it's very hard to dissect um, in, in the way that would be satisfying to answer the, the questions that, the, the, that you are asking. Uh, let, let's come back to the uh, experimental interventions. The experimental interventions with pregnant women uh, who appear to be at risk because they have uh, uh, behavior problems, they have mental health problems. Um, the, the work that David Olds has been do doing, the interventions last from early pregnancy until the child's second year of life. It's it visits, it's home visitation by nurses. And these interventions with these women have, you look 20 years down the line and their girls are adapting much better than the control group girls that didn't get this two years of intervention. So what we can see from these um, experiments is that it's possible to change the life of the children of these girls that had um, adjustment problems. But getting at exactly what was done <laughs> within mm -hmm. uh, these two years, there is a general push towards let's do everything we can right, right. to help them. And it's clear that it, it works. There is something, it, it doesn't tell us the minute details of uh, what happened in the brain of the child or during pregnancy. It's, it's telling us these interventions will save us money and will help part of uh, individuals who have problems in in the long run. Um, and so, what do the interventions consist of? So, what would a what would a girl who was a pregnant girl who who was enrolled in one of these programs e expect? What would she receive as a consequence of of the intervention? Well, sh she will receive from the nurse uh, visits at home, and the uh, the nurse will console her into everything that she has to decide in terms of the quality of what she eats during pregnancy and in the interaction she has with other people, everything mm -hmm. that's uh, difficult for them, she can share with the nurse and the nurse will help solve the problem. Yeah, well, it sounds it sounds like the provision of a of a grandmother, well, like a competent yeah, grandmother yeah, in some a, sense, a, a mother. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's not like a psychotherapy where you you follow um, exactly uh, the the way the person is thinking. It, it's it's more of a uh, and and these nurses with time learn to deal with, with these different uh, with these different problems um, there there is another approach uh, and which could be done at the same time as uh, the nurse home visitation program I think that stopping at age two is too early <laughs> uh, and I've I've been pushing for um, uh, getting um, another type of intervention, at least from age two, because we know that age two is uh, the time when um, the children have physical aggression, the more for physical aggression, they have, their problems are at the top uh, at age two. 
Um, and so the other approach that could be a good complement is daycare, quality daycare. And the experiments that have been done with daycare, quality daycare, are showing very long-term effects also on the children. I think the, uh, the best approach that has not been tried yet is uh, to, use the, to use the nurse home visitation jointly with the daycare, uh, quality daycare interventions. The quality daycare interventions have shown um, that uh, high quality daycare has long-term effects and even intergenerational long-term effects. And positive effects. Uh, and po yeah, positive okay, so, effects. Okay, so let me ask you a couple of questions about that because that's interesting in and of itself. Yes. Do you think that it has that daycare has particularly positive effects on the kids from mothers whose maternal behavior is impaired? So in Head Start, one of the hypotheses about why Head Start, the 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 wide scale anti poverty initiative. Yeah. In the U.S., one of the reasons that it had the successful outcomes it did have, which were included um, less high school dropout and uh, fewer teen pregnancies and less arrests, if I remember correctly, although yes. no impact on cognitive development. Part of the theory about why that worked was that children in particularly bad families, let's say, or particularly impaired families, got out of those families to some degree when they were put in a different uh maternal so to speak maternal setting so is it removal or is it something that's being added and do you see the benefit of daycare across the spectrum of children or is it specific to the di the more at risk kids well the the best results long term results uh, comes from jim ekman's uh, analysis uh of uh the data um uh, for the second generation. So it's clear that uh, high quality, it was the high scope uh, intervention that, that was done in Michigan uh, shows that the children who, who were in this high quality daycare compared to a control group uh, were better off as they became adults. Um, but also their own children compared to the children of those who did not go to the daycare uh, were much better off. So, okay, so what are the elements that characterize high quality daycare and at what ages and for how long? Yeah, well, the they, good quality daycare um, helps the children learn in terms of Interact, social behavior of interacting, uh, but also in, in terms of cognitive development. It's clear, uh, I've been thinking recently, looking at the, the impact of the uh, COVID-19, uh, that we are going uh, to put a lot of money on helping, uh, helping old people die later um, there's uh, the baby boomers are going to be in the daycare homes soon, and, and there's going to be a lot of people in the daycare. And uh, what happened during the epidemic uh, it will sort of push us to put more resources into helping old people um, in daycare centers. In 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 centers for yeah it's sort of daycare centers for them right uh, but we have all these children that need daycare um, and quality daycare is equivalent to the school system and it's amazing that we are not providing free daycare in the same way that we're providing free kindergarten and free elementary school and free high school. Children are at 
their best in terms of learning during the preschool years. Uh, and so we should be investing massively into getting all children into high quality daycare that will provide, they will be better prepared to benefit from elementary school and from high school and from university. It's, it's really amazing that our societies have not, are not providing free uh, quality education from essentially birth onwards. And, and we know from the research on cognitive development that the, the years where our brains are more open to learning is uh, during the early years. Um, so, okay, so, so let me ask you a couple of questions about that. I mean, there, there are uh, factors, obviously, that stand in the way. I, I mean, I worked in the daycare business for a while when I was very young and developing standards for daycare in, in Alberta. Um, the younger the children, the higher the ratio of teachers to children necessary, right? So if, you're, if you have two-year-olds in daycare, you need something approximating one teacher per three two-year-olds. And so it becomes expensive very rapidly. Be if you want a qualified uh, teacher, you need to spend $40,000 a year, let's say, to have someone with a university education. And divided by three, that's 15,000. And then you can double that for the infrastructure. So it's about $30,000 per child per year at that level for, for quality daycare. And certainly that's so much money that many people would not be able to afford that if it was there, you know, if they had, especially if they had a couple of kids. And so do you, so that's part of the reason it doesn't happen, I presume. Um, and then the question also arises is whether <laughs> children who are coming from families who are intact and, let's say, psychologically healthy to the degree that that's possible, is there an additional benefit for those children to be placed in daycare? Or is this something that's more specifically appropriate for, for the children who are at risk, for that 17%, let's say, who, who are developmentally, who are aggressive and who also have family structure that isn't optimal? Yeah, well, it, it's the, the, the work by Ekman is showing that it, it's the cost-benefit analysis is in favor of, of doing this for the children who have... Uh, who need more support. Yeah, well, I, I think I read recently that it's $350,000 a year to keep someone in prison. Yeah, uh, it's possible. <laughs> so it's extraordinarily expensive in any yes. case, and maybe that yeah. figure's wrong, but your point is that, well, there's deferred costs if those early interventions don't occur, and so yeah. it's not a savings. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, if you put together the home visitation to high-risk pregnant women, and that, I mean, pregnant women, they go and see doctors. They go uh, when they become pregnant, and it's easy to identify who needs help and who doesn't need help. So that's... So how would, you, identif how would you identify them? Well, the characteristics that, that we've uh, identified in, in terms of... Uh, schooling, uh, physical and mental health problem. Uh, okay, so a competent I mean, physician should be able to yeah, determine it's, it's, that it's without very, too much trouble. It's very easy to, to identify. And, and so if, if you give them that nurse uh, home visitation program, then, um, and once the baby is born, if you if the baby has access to daycare um, and access to daycare until um, kindergarten. And then we, we did an experiment where, where we provided um, support to parents of aggressive children, aggressive kindergarten children uh, this is uh, another uh, prevention experiment where we randomly allocated 
support to the parents, home visits to the parents, uh, support to the teacher, and social skills training with peers that are highly pro-social. So we created groups where you have the most pro-social kids and you put the least pro-social kids, one in a small group, and they become friends with them. The pro-social uh, pro -social kids help the, the less pro-social kids. And we've shown that it prevents delinquency, it prevents criminal behavior in adulthood. So if you put these different interventions together uh, from uh, essentially the start of pregnancy up to the end of elementary school, you will save a lot of money. You will help a lot of people and prevent a lot of misery in our, uh, in our societies. You grouped pro-social children in kindergarten with anti-social children. So more pro-social children in the group. And I'd like to know two things. How did you formulate the groups? Like, how did you encourage the children to, to uh, initiate friendships within that group? And were you concerned at that point that the pro-social kids would be inclined towards more violence as a consequence of being exposed to the violent kids? Because I remember Joan McCord's work, um, and they seem to indicate the longitudinal study in, yeah. um, in Somerville, Massachusetts, seemed to indicate that grouping antisocial kids together was a very bad idea. That they yes. that made them so prisons, for example, are a great yes. place to make people even more violent, uh, which is something that should also be stressed. It's not a wise intervention to group antisocial people together. Okay, so you made these groups. How did you encourage the children to to make friendships? And and well, yeah, we we did not expect that that would happen. Uh, what, what we did is we put one, um, I think it's one or, or two, I don't remember exactly, in a group of four or five. And the aim of the, the grouping was to, to learn social skills. I mean, it was sort of a, a class where you learn pro-social skills. Like Mom, what? What would constitute something you could teach? And these were four-year-old kids, basically? Uh, Three or no, four? No, no, no. They were in elementary school. Oh, so they're old. Uh, oh, they're they old. They were oh. seven. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, so, so they have a bit more grade. sophistication at that point. And what, yeah. what sort of skills were they taught? Well, it's the, the usual social skill of how you get someone to enter a group, how you help others, what you do when there's this problem or, or that problem. So it's relatively, it's the social skills uh, work that has been done since the, the 1960s. Okay, so do you think it 70s. was the social skills training or the friendships that developed that well, socialized the kids? Yeah, we, we did not, our aim was not to, that they would become friends. Right, right. Uh, our aim was that they would learn the social skills, and if if there are good models, uh, then it's easier to to learn uh, rather than having a, a group of non pro social skills trying to learn together. It's that's very hard. Uh, it's only afterwards that we discovered um, that uh, two three years later. Uh, the, the children who had problems, who, who participated in these groups, had more pro-social friends two, three years later. It's not necessarily... Right, so that's a long impact. Yeah, it's, it's not necessarily they were friends with the ones within the group. It's possible, but they probably their behavior changed and, and they were more acceptable by the pro-social kids uh, than, than those who continued to aggress them. I remember when we worked together that um, one of the things I learned was that 
The kids were aggressive at age two, and then most of them were socialized by the age of four. And if they weren't, part of what happened was that it was difficult for the kids who maintained their two-year-old level of aggression at four, or something approximating it, to make friends. Yeah. And so then they got further isolated, and that seemed to... Because... So that model is something like, well, your pa parents are obviously a very important source of socialization. You've been indicating that with mothers in particular. But as children age and become more socially sophisticated, their peers become an increasingly important source of socialization. And the reciprocity that is necessary between peers is a very important part of the socialization of pro-social behavior. And so you're aggressive at four like you were at two. None of the sophisticated four-year-olds will play with you because of that. So you're alienated and isolated and they continue to develop and you stay where you were and maybe get also angry and bitter and so forth as you're excluded. And yeah. is that is that still yes. a reasonable way of looking at it? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what appears to be happening. Um, okay, and so your intervention perhaps... Slow, stop that from happening so 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 comprehensively you got them back into the play track and yes yeah okay so yeah. there's another implication of your research i'd like to briefly discuss and 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 then we'll we'll continue with the main track there's a tremendous amount of noise i would say in the popular culture at the moment about the structure of human social organizations, crit critiques of human social organizations. So we, we tend to exist in hierarchies that are oriented towards a particular task or goal or around a, a profession, etc. And, and the criticism is something like hierarchies are tyrannical in their central nature and they're predicated on power and little else. And yet, and if that was true, what I would expect to find as a consequence of your research was that the proportion of children who use aggression as a strategy, even initially when they're two, would be much higher. Like if power is actually the force that moves you up social hierarchies, then the default uh, mode of interaction should be force. But f your research indicates that the force, the ability to use force is there in the beginning, but that it isn't overwhelmingly widely dispersed. And even more importantly, as children are socialized into these hierarchies, they become much less aggressive rather than more. And so to me, that's a, that's a fatal blow to theories that posit that sophisticated hierarchical organizations are likely to be dominated by those people who do nothing but exercise power. And I don't, yeah. I'd like well, your opinion about... Yeah. All of that, or at least some of it. <laughs> I guess it depends on how you define power. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, well, if, I would say if, I exert power on you when I'm, I'm compelling you to do something you wouldn't do voluntarily. Yeah, yeah. But in, in early childhood, it's physical aggression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that as we become more sophisticated, what we learn in early childhood is, is to talk, <laughs> is to interact and convince people by what you say. Uh, so it becomes very verbal rather than, than, than physical. Well, we learn to dance too. I mean, one of the things yeah. you learn if you're a successful child is how to take turns. Yes, yes, yeah. And and that's an unbelievably important scaffold for, for well for conversation for example, but certainly for shared games and and cooperative activity. Yes, yes. And it's the children that can't do that and that default to aggression that don't do well. Yes. Um, and and I, I guess there are so many things that go wrong with those who cannot adjust to to the group that it's not one thing it, it's a number of things that prevents them from um, getting on with others and getting the others to accept them in in their group and so they become rejected and the rejected are the ones that aggress uh, the others uh, and, and to some extent some uh, 
have pleasure in being rejected. They provoke others and, and they're happy if the others get mad. And yeah, so well, they, they'll look, kids will default to whatever strategy provides them with any attention whatsoever. Yes. And if they can't yeah. do it in a sophisticated way, they're going to do it in an unsophisticated way. Yes, exactly. So and they can occupy that niche and, and get whatever um, attention is left over as a consequence of that. I mean, I don't think there's anything that a child finds more intolerable than being absolutely ignored. Exactly. I agree. Okay, so um, how has your work been received broadly? And what, Im I mean, you won this award from the, uh, uh, St you won the St Stockholm Prize, the 2000, oh, it was St. Augustine, by the way. Yes. <laughs> it was St. Augustine. So, Yeah, I uh, was looking for it myself. <laughs> so you, you won the 2017 Stockholm Prize in Criminology, and, and the Scandinavians have done a tremendous amount of long-term, high-quality work on criminology and aggression and all of that. So you're obviously receiving a fair bit of attention from your peers. How has your work been received broadly among sociologists and all of the other members of disciplines that are that are that have some focus on criminality and aggression yes well i no, i was surprised when i uh, heard that i was getting the the, the stockholm prize um, the stockholm prize is given by an international it, it's sort of the equivalent of it it's meant to be the equivalent of the nobel prize for for criminology uh, and I'm not a criminologist. Uh, uh, I was trained as an educational psychologist. Um, and I was surprised that they gave me this prize because uh, criminology has been, is, I mean, it's closer to sociology. It's, it's, uh, it's a social science, more social than psychology is um, right so it's concentrating on group determinants of behavior economic factors and yes. and 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 social factors rather than intrinsic psychological factors at the level of the individual yes yes exactly and, and so um, the idea that we are uh, we we are born good and it's the environment that makes us bad is is more the way criminologists would look at life uh, than, than the fact that we we have we are born to survive in the jungle and the environment makes us adapt and adjust to a, a, a less violent environment. I was I was surprised that um, I, I was getting the the award because my my work has been more uh, uh, sci psychological and, and to a certain extent uh, criticizing the the perspective that um, uh, we are uh, society um, <clears throat> is is not uh, making us bad <laughs> but um, <clears throat> But so, by and large, making us better. Yes. Um, and I guess that there is clearly in criminology, uh, um, people are recognizing more and more um, the, the psychological perspectives uh, of human development. And there is clearly an openness to the type of work that we have been doing, uh, both in terms of the experimental work. Uh, it's very hard for people to um, say that uh, this is only words. When you do an experiment, you have a control group and, and you show <laughs> the long-term effects uh, of of these interventions. Well, I also think it's it's harder to um, what avoid what the data is indicating if the data results have also come as a surprise to the researcher. 
I mean, yeah. you said, and I mean, that's been my experience constantly as a research psychologist, is that I find out things that not only did I not expect, that I really didn't like. Yes. And, but yeah. those are much more compelling. And so you came in at this with a Rousseauian viewpoint, essentially. And, but what you saw convinced you that that wasn't an appropriate uh, perceptual frame, let's say. And, and yes. so, so it's good to see that the, the criminologists have been open to this. And, and what has been the consequence of that? And what do you think the most trenchant remaining criticisms of your approach and your theorizing are? Like, where are the weaknesses in what you're doing as far as you're concerned? Um, well, the, uh, I think the most important weakness is not, not being able to do experiments that are still, that are much bigger than uh, the experiments that, that we have done. It's, it's hard to do these uh, experiments, the, the randomized controlled trials. It's you know, I don't think there's any more difficult psychological research endeavor than um, experimental interventions. Yes. I mean, the hurdles are immense. It's impossible yes. to get subjects. There's, there's ethical concerns of, of a multitude of sorts. It's unbelievably expensive. It's time consuming. It's hard. It takes years before you generate data to publish. Um, there's a high probability that your intervention is going to fail. You need an entire bureaucracy to run it that has to be maintained over years. It's so difficult. I'm amazed that anyone ever does it. Yeah. Well, I've, um, over the years, I've uh, tried many times uh, to convince, uh, I, I managed to convince one very rich man <laughs> to support uh, and to, to, to support the work that we were doing. And it's in his, his environment <laughs> that convinced over time uh, made, made so much trouble that we had to drop it, um, to, to drop this, uh, this research, uh, not because he didn't want it, but he, one morning he said, Richard, I don't get the support from the people around me and, and I can't go on with this. <laughs> they, they are making my life too difficult. And so we What kind it. of obstacles did he run into? as well, a consequence they, they, of, of supporting your research? Well, it was mainly the opinion uh, of the people around him. Um, it, he's a billionaire. Uh, a lot of people want his money. And um, he was telling me, let's go, let's do it. Um, but after a while, I uh, said, uh, I'm getting too much negative uh, comments about about what you're doing and and what what uh, what like why what are the objections is it is it focused on the idea that the unpalatable idea that there that there is a biology of aggression let's say or that it's early onset and innate in people or like i'm very curious about this because i see these sorts of hypothetically ethical objections to scientific endeavor popping up more and more frequently everywhere and it doesn't surprise me because the fact that we were ever able to do genuine scientific research at all is a complete bloody miracle. I mean, it's only been around for 300 years and it's only happened once. So it, we don't know the preconditions, but what, what, are, the, what are the obstacles that he faced and, and, uh, and you face, let's say, uh, as a consequence of your critics? Well, um, the consequences uh, are that... Uh, for me, are that um, I think we have the means to advance knowledge, so it's like medicine, um, but we don't have the support from uh, the, the research agencies uh, don't have enough money to support these interventions. So you either get the money from someone who's very rich, who wants to change the world, or you get support from uh, the Ministry of Education, from the Ministry of Health. Um, and each time I've sort of 
almost got it, <laughs> got the support. It's, it was taken away um, for uh, political reasons. Um, and, and the political reasons are what? what what's the objection? What, what is it that's, that's... I mean, we should also point out that you were radically successful at acquiring research funds yeah, compared sure. to other research scientists. And I mean, that also is a testament to your skill as an administrator and, and a communicator as well as a researcher, because it's very rare that those three things come together because they're all very difficult. So you've had success, but what's, what's driving opposition? And also, has that got worse in recent years? What's, what's been your experience over the last while? Well, over the last year with the pandemic, we appear to be having more success. Uh, the, there is uh, the, the Quebec government uh, has been putting in a lot of money um, for, uh, in research in terms of helping uh, to see what's what's coming a and hopefully we will put in we will be able to put in some experiments um, but I, I guess the, the biggest uh, handicap is that governments and I think it's like that everywhere are not really ready to experiment if, if you think of the of edu the education of children, we should constantly be experimenting, well, that's measuring. That's what the faculties of education should have been doing for the last 50 yeah. years. Yes. And they've it, done virtually none of it. No. And that, that's my, I guess, my biggest frustration is... It, it's, yeah, I can't believe we don't have technologies to teach children to read in six months by now. I mean... Yes, yeah. It's just, it's, it's appalling. Mm. Also curious about the degree to which you've run into philosophical opposition because of the anti-Rousseauian, let's say, nature or the partial anti-Rousseauian nature of your research, because it does push against the, the general consensus of the time. Yeah, well, uh, it, from the criminology and social that and the social sciences in, in general, uh, that was the, the main criticism in, in the sense that uh, um, <clears throat> the social sciences are, are, are more based on a Rousseauian approach uh, to understanding who we are um, than the biological science and the um, psychology from a, a biological perspective. Um, <clears throat> but I, I guess uh, part part of that, as as you know well, is uh, personality <laughs> of the people who who go into different fields. Of, we we go into a field where we feel at ease uh, with the way the majority are thinking, and it's very hard to to change the way people think. Uh, and I guess yes, well, uh, that's why we need science and research and experiments yeah. because we're so hard to teach that we need the data to be and to be hit over the head with it repeatedly before we can alter our presuppositions. Yeah, um, but what you said earlier in our conversation is that it it's it's relatively rare that you find something that is sort of opposite to what you think and you accept it and you say, ah, oh, <laughs> I, I, I had not thought things were like that. No, you have to train graduate students for like five years before they can do that. Yeah. Before they get convinced that that's when you've actually, actually know you've discovered something. This is surprising. I'd rather it would go away, but I can't make it go away. Despite my wishes, maybe it's true. Yeah. Um, but it, it's so satisfying when you sort of look back and you say, I was going that way and look where I, I'm completely the opposite of where I, I thought I should be going. And 
people need to understand that that is satisfying. It's satisfying to say, I was wrong. That, that, that's crazy. What that, the way you, I was looking at things is the wrong way. And so I think that's, that's what science provides. If, if you're doing science, not to confirm what you think, but doing science to learn new things and, and understand things that you did not understand before. Well, one of the things that, that, that shaped the way I think, I guess there were two things. One was the realization, and that was partly as a consequence of, of, of being exposed to Joan McCord's work in, in uh, Somerville, because that was an early intervention program for antisocial behavior and other at-risk behaviors that made things worse much to her surprise, her, her, her continual personal surprise. I mean, that shaped the entirety of her career, that, because they, they did a broad-scale intervention with at-risk kids, and yet the outcome showed that the experimental group did worse on almost every outcome measure. And the conclusion was that they, they sent the kids out of the city to summer camp together, and that seemed to be a fatal error, essentially. Grouping yes. them together made them much more prone to aggression, but also all sorts of mental illnesses. And so uh, it was evident whenever you talk to Dr. McCord, how shocked she was that that had occurred. And she, she spent a lot of her uh, time after that telling social scientists, look, don't be so sure that your stupid intervention is going to produce the results that you wish it would. The world's a lot more complicated than that. And so once you start to understand that your a priori axiom might do a tremendous amount of damage if it is allowed untrammeled access to the broader culture. It tends to make you much more conservative as a research designer and thinker. And, and that should, you know, it's very difficult and scary to have one of your axioms violated because you have to do a lot of reconsideration. But it's also very frightening to know that you could be an agent of catastrophe despite your well-meaning efforts. And that's actually the most likely outcome when you do a social science intervention, because it's very hard to make things better and it's really easy to make them worse. Hmm. So you also showed that, you've also delved into the biology of this and, the, and, and in a variety of interesting ways, there's the basic biology. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about the biology of aggressive behavior and its dysregulation. Uh, so I'll start that off. and and. I've been very attracted by the uh, behavioral neuroscientists, Panksepp and Jeffrey Gray, Yak Panksepp and Jeffrey Gray particularly, and they've basically shown that we have modules, neuropsychological models, modules, neurophysiological modules for our basic emotions and motivations and fear and surprise and uh, disgust and play, for that matter, hunger, sex drive, defensive aggression, um, uh, um, predatory aggression, which I think is more what you're studying, is the aggression in the service of an aim rather than defensive aggression. Um, and so these modules are there right from the beginning. They manifest themselves in individually different ways, and then they're brought under control or integrated as people develop. What do you see as key to the biological understanding of the kinds of, of aggression itself, but also of the kinds of differences in aggression that you're studying? Um, I, I must admit that I have not uh, been focused on the biological dimensions, except, except the once I understood about epigenetics, um, I sort of turned to... Uh, uh, look at the the, the importance uh, of epigenetics. Um, and, and so you were interested in the intergenerational transmission or of aggressive behavior. And is that what led you in? And we should also define epigenetics, let everybody know what, what that signifies and what you were exploring. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I guess it was um, around 2004. I, I, I was part of a, um, uh, the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research uh, that Fraser Mustard had created. 
um, where we were a committee on human development. And um, one of our guests uh, was Moishe Schiff uh, from McGill University, a biologist who, who was working on, on epigenetics with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with Michael, um, mm, I'm not. Rudder? So, uh, no, with uh, Michael Meany. Oh, here at, at, at McGill University. And, and Moishi, uh, we were, there was a group of geneticists, uh, genetic, yeah, geneticists. Uh, that group of geneticists was working on human development. And, and so Moishi came and showed us uh, the mechanism, the epigenetic mechanisms of mothering um, that uh, rats that are well licked um, at birth, um, their brains are changed their, uh, it has an impact on gene expression and they live yeah, well, alone. if they're licked, they're cared for. It's really yeah, important. It's, right. it's not a trivial it's, behavior. It's yeah. it's the focus of maternal love and competence in rats. So, yeah. I mean, people often don't understand how relevant animal research can be. And this is a, I mean, who studies licking in rats. It's like, no, no, you don't <laughs> understand. This is a key component of social interaction and protection. And it signifies the existence of a relatively benevolent environment. Exactly. Yeah, uh, and, and so these rats were living longer. So licking had a long-term impact on, on the lives of, of, of these pups. And, and I remember that was 2004, and most of the geneticists around uh, the, the, the table were saying, ah, this is incredible. And, and they were sort of, not really accepting <laughs> that the explanation that that Moishi was uh, uh, was giving uh, of uh, facilitating gene expression and influencing brain development. Yeah. So so let's stop there and take that apart a minute because this is quite remarkable. Yeah. So. Look, one of the things that can happen when you're exposed to a new environment is that you can acquire new information and you learn. But another thing that can happen is the environment can turn on one set of genes um, that are relevant to neural development or another set. And so it's as if, in some sense, that your genes contain a tremendous amount of not expressed potential. And then you enter an environment and that set of potentials relevant to that environment turns on. And, it's, the, and it, it's reminiscent to me of the Platonic theory that all knowledge is remembering in some sense, is that we have this massive store of potential residing inside our biological apparatus coded at the genetic level, but that's not necessarily turned on because of the, or because of the environments that we inhabit or don't inhabit. Okay, so you put rats in a benevolent environment, rat pups in a benevolent environment, and that turns on a certain set of of uh, genetic codes that alters, well, things as fundamental as their lifespan. And so what's the epi in epigenetics there? It's, it's, the, it's the environmental impact on the genetic structure. Yes. And yeah. sometimes that can be transmissible, which is also revolutionary. Yes, yes, yeah. And it's been shown with, uh, with humans. Uh, so um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I invited Moishi uh, to work with us. And so we, we've been doing, um, uh, we've been doing epigenetic studies uh, of the children uh, that, uh, that we, we are following. And we've been showing that the children who are sort of chronic aggressives, um, have we see differences in in epigenetic expression? Um, so we've done that with a small sample of boys in in our sample, and, and um, 
The results have been confirmed in a larger longitudinal study in, uh, in Great Britain, um, where they've shown that um, the quality of mothering is uh, impacting gene expression in early childhood and has long-term consequences on behavior uh, during early adulthood. Now, in this, this paper that was published in Nature, it's an, it's an interview with you, it talks about Suomi's research. Yeah. Um, DNA difference in DNA methylation patterns between nurtured monkeys and those separated from their mothers. Yes. And, and Suomi's, Suomi's research indicates that um, postnatal adversity, so that be maternal disruption in the maternal bond, affects more than 4,000 genes, what is one-fifth of the genome, and that it tends to cluster in certain chromosomal regions, and also that it alters expression of a gene that Somi's group had linked to the function of, of serotonin, which is a, like, it's like the conductor of the entire yeah. neurological symphony, yeah. a very, very crucially important um, neurotransmitter. And so you, you also... That you you ran a parallel research pathway with Suomi as well, and was that related to the one that you did that yes. you ran with Moisha? Yeah, yeah. Suomi was part of the committee of the CIHR uh, committee where where Moishi came to uh, give us a talk, and we decided because Steve Suomi's work uh, has been they were separating the babies from their mothers at birth. Um, right, so it's a very dramatic intervention. Yeah, that that was it has has been done. Um, it's Harlow that started this work in the I guess the nineteen late nineteen fifties, early right. 1960s. He studied. He had the famous studies with the cloth covered wire uh, pseudo mothers and the wire mothers. Yeah. So so it was all about the attachment of the child to to the mother. So the, the brains of these uh, monkeys had been saved. And um, so Steve Sumi said, well, let's look at the epigenetic uh, differences for these monkeys that were separated at birth and those who weren't separated. So it's a, it's, it's a wonderful uh, way of showing that separation from your mother at birth has behavioral consequences, but it also has important uh, consequences on gene expression in your brain. Right. So it's even, in some sense, it's even more fundamentally important. And yes. so do you, do you think, do you think that the, the disruption of the mother child relationship that you see in the families that fail to inhibit the expression of aggression do you think that that's akin to maternal deprivation? It's it's just a lesser. I mean, you can imagine a continuum of of yes. maternal care with absolute separation at one end and perfect bonding at the other. There's going to be a continuum, and more impaired mothers have a, have a less. Um, the 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 disruption in the behavior is akin to partial to partial separation from the mother, something like that. Yes. I mean, yeah. psycho psychoanalysts, psychologists have always made much of the necessity of the, Eric Erickson, for example, as well, of the absolute necessity of that initial bond. And, yes. that, and that's yeah. associated with, well, with really basic behaviors, touch, play, like fundamental behaviors. And you see, for example, studies showing that, I, I remember these studies uh, of mothers breastfeeding, um, depressed and non-depressed mothers breastfeeding and the videos were sped up and you could see the non-depressed mothers and the baby who was breastfeeding in this kind of dance where one would move and then the other would move and the and then the mother would move and there's this synchrony and reciprocity already emerging in the course of breastfeeding that was disrupted among the depressed mo mothers and their children and and so you can trace the development of that reciprocity back way way to the beginning and I, you know, I think it definitely manifests itself in in the highly social structuring of such things, such primordial things as feeding, might also be a reason why it's the mother's behavior that's so crucial in the in the early stages because she's so integrally involved in that early reciprocity. 
Yes, and so that's after birth, but you can imagine that even during pregnancy, you have these different effects on what the mother is living is affecting the development of the brain of the child in utero. Yeah, well, you wonder if, like, if the postnatal environment is harsher, let's say, and less welcoming, are the epigenetic transformations uh, producing preparation for existence in a much more Hobbesian world? Yes, well, that's one, that's one hypothesis. Uh, that that you <laughs> your brain is prepared to uh, survive in a very tough world uh, compared to others who, who had a, a, a more gentle environment uh, during pregnancy. Right. The, so the assumption yeah. would be that, in some sense, the assumption that your biology is making is that perhaps the reason the mother's behavior is altered. In a, in a negative way is because she is genuinely in a negative environment. That is yes. a harsher environment. Yeah. And so aggression, perhaps in a harsher environment, is a, associated with a higher probability of, of, of um, survival. But, you, but you, you did indicate, we talked about this just a trifle, you don't have evidence suggesting, though, that the more aggressive kids are doing better in their group of, of rejected children, let's say. Because I always wonder, is there a pa parallel hierarchy? There's obviously a hierarchy in prison. Yes. And so w if, if you look at men in prison, what is it that the men who are doing better are doing? Are they the more violent criminals? Are they the more aggressive people? Or is it even in prisons, does reciprocity... I mean, obviously, if you have a gang, loyalty is still rewarded, and you're going to be looked on very badly if you... Um, don't maintain the integrity of your gang. There's a certain risk. That's that's what that's the socialized violent uh, pattern, as opposed to the just chaotic violent pattern. Do you, do you think it's a developmental mechanism gone astray that the epigenetic transformation constitutes, or is it is it a parallel form of adaptation? Well, I uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's. There's all these very nice things that uh, need to be studied and, uh, and understood. Um, so it's for, for those who are interested in psychology, there's uh, a lot of interesting research that needs to be done in the future. And so let, let's maybe we can, we can close this off with a bit of discussion about um, the, the career of a psychological researcher. It's, it's not something that people know a lot about. I mean, what's, what, uh, how, how would you evaluate your career? Has it been, has it been what you wanted it to be and why? What, what's been well, compelling and interesting about it? And, yeah. And who should consider such a thing, such a career? Well, you, you know, uh, people ask me uh, if, if I'm, I'm still working, uh, if I'm retired. And my answer is, I cannot retire. I've never worked. Um, it's, I, I think my whole, when I look at my whole career, I've had fun doing what I, I, I was doing. And I would never have imagined doing what I did uh, from, from uh, year to year. I, I could not have predicted what, what was coming. I started my career um, in, in prisons, uh, working with, with prisoners. And over time, I, I then worked with juvenile delinquents, and then I went to work uh, with uh, preschool children, and and, then, and when you say worked, what did you? What do you mean? What were you doing at that time? Um, with uh, I, I work with mentally ill offenders. I, I was uh, a psychologist who, who was uh, trying to treat these people. A clinical. And, you're working as yeah. a clinical psychologist. Well, yeah, counselor. I was, 
I was an educational psychologist in a, in a, a unit uh, of uh, mental, mentally ill offenders. And then I worked with juvenile delinquents. And eventually I went to do my PhD and did my PhD on the treatment of uh, juvenile delinquents. And it's over time, I sort of went further and further in terms of, uh, I started research on, on kindergarten children and following them over time. And what do you think tilted you, Richard, what do you think tilted you in the research direction? I mean, you were practicing as a counselor, essentially, and I assume that you found that engaging and, and meaningful, I, although I might be wrong, maybe you were looking for something else, but there was something in the research domain that, that attracted your attention and your interest, what do you think it was? Um, I, I, um, the first research I did was uh, at the bachelor level um, in physical education. I did a bachelor in physical education and, and um, I simply loved doing <laughs> the research I was doing on the flexibility in yoga. Um, but the pleasure uh, of doing something where you control and, and you check and, and you're not sure uh, uh, and you finally get data and you analyze the data. Um, yeah, well, it's like, I remember there's a Russian data analysis that's like, like pulling the, the, the handle on a, a slot machine. You know, you put all these months of effort into setting up these experiments and then you do an analysis and you wait, you know, in 30 seconds, you're going to find out whether this was a complete bloody catastrophic waste of time or whether you've actually hit gold. Yes. And there's something, un you know, I mean, I found statistics pretty dry when I was looking at other people's data or when I was, you know, going through the mechanics of learning it, but once it was being applied to data sets I had generated, I couldn't get enough of the analytic tools. And there is a real, ex and I mean, I love doing counseling and clinical work, but there was something really engaging and compelling about the research. Yeah. The, and I find that planning the research is, is interesting. I, I love writing grant proposals um, because in, write, in writing a proposal and trying to convince others to give you money to do something, you have to review the literature very well and you sort of understand, you, you start understanding <laughs> uh, this idea that you have in your head much better. Uh, so th the whole process uh, of thinking about a problem, submitting a proposal, doing the uh, collection of data, analyzing the data, and, and writing up the papers. It, these are all different things that are extremely interesting to do in themselves. Uh, and putting all that together, um, uh, I mean, 40 years has gone like this <laughs> uh, because you're sort of immersed into this, uh, this work. Uh, and uh, There's something wonderful about having the opportunity to really devote time to specifying and unpacking a complex problem. Yeah. It's something I really love. I love doing collectively too with the people like you that I had yes. the pleasure to work with across time. You know, we could, we could focus on a problem that was philosophically compelling. I mean, when we started this discussion with like, well, are, are human beings innately aggressive or does society make them that way? Well, you yeah. know, that's a major philosophical problem. It's like, okay, well, we can, and then you sit down with your colleagues and you generate a bunch of ideas about uh, like a whole plethora of hypotheses about what might be the case and what not. And that's fun too, because that blows you out of your ideological presuppositions. If you have a good group of people and you make much more detailed, you generate much more detailed ideas. And so that hypothesis generating part of the process, which is not well specified and almost never talked about methodologically, that's really exciting. So you get people together, they've all read, it was one, one of the things that was so fun about working with you and Bob is that you both had encyclopedic knowledge of 
literatures that weren't overlapping. And so, and and I brought my own knowledge to bear on the subject and yeah. the, the, the interactions between us and, well, many other people that we both worked with expands the whole universe of conceptualization at the hypothesis level and then you have the ability to find out if you're actually wrong which is such a privilege because that's the problem with philosophy in some sense is you, you can never be shown to be wrong whereas science will show you and then you can do something that's maybe a bit better as a consequence so yes yeah exactly it's it is a ridiculously exciting endeavor despite the despite the obstacles and the difficulty in getting published and so forth but that's all built into it too that in in a way that's necessary so and, and you so, do have the 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 possibility of producing some permanent alteration in human knowledge you know i think that it 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 definitely seems to me that the research that you've done is of broad philosophical interest. It's like, well, look, first of all, most people aren't that aggressive right from the beginning. So aggression, it's certainly not the expression of aggression that we're primarily selected for. However, there is a subset and, and they, and it tends to be pretty stable in that subset. And, but those are people who have generally suffered impairments in their primary relationships, fundamental impairments in their primary relationships. So it's actually a deviation from the human norm, although an important one, rather than something that's central to the optimal pathway of human development. And then you have the, the uh, exquisite pleasure of perhaps addressing that and learning from your, uh, your attempts to address in a way that also pulls you in some sense out of the political Right, because it becomes so pragmatic and so practical, although also still philosophically interesting, you, you you can you can specify it at a level of detail that makes the political irrelevant. And that's actually when you know you've specified it at the right level of detail. It's like, well, no, your your ideology isn't gonna provide an answer here. It might provide a hypothesis, but that's all. And so and it's also extremely uh entertaining to uh, mentor people along that developmental pathway and to watch yeah. them learn to think and and it's a very complicated and and all-consuming process that research that of being a research scientist so so is there anything is there anything that we missed that's really relevant oh yes there is i uh, wanted to ask you about sex differences in aggression <laughs> so there's a the 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 physical aggression tends to be more common among males. Okay, yes. so what you've studied boys and girls. We need to talk about the girls. So t let uh, I'm opening the floor. T let's let's talk about girls' aggression. Well, uh, girls are use more indirect aggression uh, than physical aggression uh, compared to uh, to boys. Uh, and I mean, it, it makes it makes sense in the, from a biological perspective, from a physical perspective. Girls are are less uh, able to to win a physical fight uh, than 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 boys. Um, so so there is this indirect uh, aggression and. I guess similarly to boys, the girls who are uh, more aggressive compared to the other girls and more hyperactive. So there is aggression and hyperactivity. Those are the girls that have in the long run, the more uh, problems. They, the, Aggressive, aggressive in the sense of indirect, indirect aggression. Yeah, can you take that apart a bit? What, what, are, what kind of you have markers for physical aggression? Hitting, okay. kicking, biting, yeah. stealing. Okay. What are the markers yeah. for indirect? Okay, aggression? the markers for um, it, it's uh, it's talking to some talking about someone uh, and telling how bad that person is. Uh, you know, it, it's. The the indirect aggression of uh, it is more doing things behind the back of others. 
So it's it's sub subversive reputation destruction. Yeah, uh, essentially that's that's the, which the, seems to scale quite well in online environments. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess so. Um, so um, girls who, who are more indirect in aggression prone and are at the same time hyperactive are the ones who will have much more problems in life and are likely to be the mothers who are the, the ones who will be less successful uh, with their children. In, right, in so, it's, so there's no evidence that it's a good strategy. No. It doesn't seem to be producing a desirable outcome. No. Uh, I, I suspect that... Um, and in saying this, I realize that we haven't looked at that, um, that the intelligence must play a role in, in this, in the sense that the more intelligent they are, uh, probably the more successful they are. Uh, but But the girls in general, the girls who have in uh, childhood uh, are hyperactive and are also uh, tend to aggress others from an indirect way. And how, how early can you see that? Because it requires a certain degree of verbal ability or, or do you see young girls like dragging one playmate away from another to, to as a form of indirect aggression, say that would be more behavioral measure. How early can you detect yeah, that? Well, we, we've done it from kindergarten. Um, and it's, it's based on, uh, it's based on report teacher reports. Um, and I, I guess we've done it also in, in daycare. Um, but the, the long-term data that we have comes from, uh, teacher reports uh, on these behaviors. So we should do a little sideways move there too. I mean, you know, there are various ways you can derive data, direct observation. You can get peer reports of children talking about their peers. You can get reports from parents, mothers or fathers or mothers and fathers, and you can get teacher reports. And my, my memory is that of those of that category, forget direct observation for a minute, the teacher reports tend to be reasonably accurate because teachers are familiar with a wide range of children's behavior. So they are somewhat better at comparing children, whereas parents have a much narrower exposure. Yeah. Is that is that still yeah, stand up? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's an important uh, finding that kindergarten teachers can identify both boys and girls who will have long-term problems. Right. So, so we, we need to rely on what the kindergarten teachers are telling us about the behavior of the children, because those behaviors are good predictors of having problems in the long run. And so we need to do interventions early at the end of uh, uh, kindergarten and in first grade that are based on these teacher reports. Uh, the, the teachers are really very reliable in, in terms of identifying- Early, early, early diagnosis, so, so to speak. Yes, of long-term problems. Richard, are the girls who are more likely to use indirect aggression are they specifically the mothers who are most likely to give rise to aggressive boys? Or, or is, it, is it more general, um, what, lack of optimal function, something like that? Or how specific it is, is it to the proclivity for aggression? Well, um, we, we have uh, data um, up to age 40 in terms of how su successful uh, these children became as adults. And the teacher reports uh, of uh, these behaviors, hyperactivity and aggression, are very good 
predictors of how much money people will have in terms of, of, of win on the job market um, when they are in their 40s. Right. So that's hierarchical position in the socioeconomic pyramid, essentially. Yeah. And do you remember the effect sizes, just out of curiosity? What, what kind of correlations are you managing to produce between the teacher reports of kindergarten behavior and, and outcomes at 40? Um, I, I cannot remember uh, that okay well uh, exactly. the fact that they're significant at all is is yeah. dead relevant because yes. that's a, that's a huge gap in time yeah and i mean the only thing i can think of that would be that stable perhaps would be the incidence of aggressive behavior because it tends to be really stable but also c general cognitive ability because it tends to be extremely stable as well yeah. so so hyperactivity uh, impulsivity aggression in kindergarten those who are really not in relatively good control are at high risk of failing in school and, and failing for for the rest of their lives and this tells us that we can <laughs> we can rely on teacher reports and we should use that to give services uh, to children early on and our experimental work has shown that that if if you rely on these assessment and you give support to these high risk children in early elementary school it will change their lives and it's not being done systematically enough we we sort of wait wait it's wait it's interesting you know cuz i i talked to bjorn lomberg a while back and he's put together multiple teams of economists to rank order world problems, serious world problems by the potential return on investment in spending money to solve them. And frequently what comes up at the top of the lists are interventions in early childhood to increase early childhood health, health particularly, uh, nutrition, etc. It's a, it's a, the R ROIs, return on investment is like 250 to one. It's, it's remarkable. But you're saying something quite similar, which is, you yes. know, this is this is an intelligent play. And it would be so nice to see public policy increasingly informed by a combination in some sense of science and economics, right? And And you could also see that that could produce, at least in some cases, consensus across ideological barriers. It's like, well, really, you, if you're conservative, you really want more criminal adolescents and young males? Probably not. You know, anything to reduce violent criminality seems to be a plus. If you're on the left side of the spectrum, you think, well, those are disenfranchised people, uh, mothers and, and, and those families, and so devoting resources to the amelioration of that problem seems to be ethically demanded, not just justified. And so, well, hopefully that's the purpose of public education, right? Is that we can make this information as broadly known as possible. That And so maybe I'll sum it up a bit and you can add every, anything you want. And so your research has indicated that um, aggression, which especially physical aggression, hitting, kicking, biting, stealing, um, is not precisely species typical behavior because most children, young children, don't engage in that except sporadically. There is a population that does it more uh, uh, regularly and predictably with greater frequency they tend to come from disturbed maternal environments um, there are interventions that can ameliorate that they're cost effective from a return on investment point of view and they have broad positive effects the effects of the um, suboptimal maternal environments are uh, are uh, what would you call it they're wide ranging you see the detrimental effects of a disturbed maternal environment across a wide range of behaviors, including propensity to violence. There's a multi-generational proclivity, and that's all accompanied by biological changes that are quite profound and that also may have multi-generational consequences. That, and then I'd add to that the gender difference, um, yes. that, that there are patterns of aggression that characterize males more particularly, although some females, and and patterns that characterize females, although also some males, and the ones and the and it also seems to be easier to m ameliorate the 
uh, tendency towards aggression in girls than it does in boys. That's that seems to be about. That seems to be a reasonable coverage of cover of what we've of what we've talked about. Anything that you want to add to that, or that you think people should know that we haven't talked about that you know about? Yeah, well, uh, I think we've covered uh, most of it. Um, I. There's nothing that um, I can think of that we've missed. Although we probably missed a few things, but I can't, no doubt. Think, can't think about it. No doubt. Uh, well, thank you very much for talking to me today and, and for walking through this. I hope people, I presume, I expect that people will find it extremely interesting and illuminating and surprising and practically useful and also, I would say, hopefully, inspiring. You know, it's, it's so nice to hear you talk about what you've discovered and why it's relevant, but also that engaging in the process of learning all of this has been um, deeply meaningful philosophically and practically, and that, that you can speak of excitement with your re about your research career and about the people that you've mentored and the entire process ranging across all of the elements of the scientific process and that you view that in retrospect as well that you're still doing it first mm -hmm. of all because you love it yeah. and in retrospect you think it was a wonderful way to spend your life and so hooray for all of that and you know you despite and this is something that's very positive too is despite the counter-cultural um what would you say results of your research You've actually been remarkably successful at gaining research money on a, compar com on a comparative basis and of publishing. And like you could get this out there. The, the scientific endeavor is robust enough so that even findings that don't run in the direction that people might like do tend to be generated and, and published and discussed and have an impact over time. No reason for cynicism or undue cynicism. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I agree. The, the world is open to uh, new ideas and, and change. It just takes time, and it's a pity that we, uh, we don't have a few centuries to live. <laughs> we have to sort of count on the next generation uh, to continue the work. Uh, and from my perspective, we've had so many great students uh, that are doing um, exceptional work. Uh, and uh, the future to me looks very bright in terms of the advancement of, of the science uh, of human behavior. We've come from a long way. Uh, there's a long tradition uh, behind us, uh, but uh, there's an exciting future. Um, I hope I'll continue to see part of it. A and you've been, uh, Jordan, you've uh, played a, an important role in, uh, in, in this uh, path towards uh, uh, convincing people that research is an important, uh, very important way of, of ameliorating the life of humans. So let's, let's close with one practical um, issue. If you were going to recommend to a young person what they should study to prepare to be a research, a psychological researcher, a clinical psychological researcher of, of your type, what what's what should what should they do at the bachelor's level let's say what what's the right preparation and then let's walk through the process bachelor master's phd postdoc because people don't know that and so what what do you look for in a student at the if you're looking for a master's level student what should have they done in their bachelor's degree um unfortunately we are not <laughs> we are not working with uh, students at the bachelor at the bachelor level um, probably because I haven't been teaching for for the past uh, 25 years and so I'm not in contact with uh, 
with, with bachelor level students. But from what I can, um, I can say from my own experience and interacting with some of the younger students, it, it's, I guess they have to be passionate and at the same time ready to work very hard uh, to um, clarify uh, how you go about understanding uh, what you want to to understand. Uh, so th you need it's it's you almost need both a, of those. You need the yeah, interest and the I, discipline. I, I guess it's it's like that in every discipline, even a hockey player or a football player. It is if you want to be successful. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah you need to be interested you have, because you have that's... to want to, yeah. and at the same time, you have to take the time and uh, and like investing yourself. Uh... Thanks again, Richard. I it's much appreciated and it's really good to see you again and to talk to you it's been well, far too long it's i don't think we've seen each other for 20 years maybe yeah, it's a at long least, time at least yeah yes yeah. you were a very young man then <laughs> yes 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 it was it was back in the late 90s i think like yes. uh, that was yeah. the last time i spent time with you in montreal so yes. yeah it's a long time ago so well, I learned a tremendous amount working with you and yeah. from your research, and, and it's been extremely um, engaging and, and useful. And I hope everyone who's listening has found this useful and, and, and interesting. So thanks and again. You, you haven't lost your passion. No, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, it's still there. So thank God for that. Great. Well, keep it, Jordan. It's a wonderful passion. Thank you.